Hey, how we doing, One Church family? You guys all right? It's good to see you. I love you. I hope you're well. Um, I want to say to all of you that are new, welcome. We hope that you are walking in here going, man, this, this feels like family. I feel like I'm a part of something where I, I already feel right at home, and, and we hope that you uh, feel loved and accepted here because you are. And so we want to say that to the, sa- the same way to everybody online. If you guys will join me, say hi to them. We're glad that you're with us as well. Thanks for joining us. So um, I hope you guys are fired up because today uh, I believe God's going to move in a powerful way. Wow, that was the Father already moving in a powerful way. And so um, we're in a series right now that's called I'm All In. And so uh, what we do during the first of the year, every year, is we go back and we talk about our unique DNA as a church. I think it's important that we take time to talk about the vision and the mission. And so for those of you that are new, we sort of talk and shop right now. Okay, it's insider language, and it's gonna be good for you to learn about who we are and for us to revisit and recommunicate what we do and why we do it. And so here's the simple statement. I believe that we're here to know God, right, and to make him known, to love him vertically and then horizontally help, help other people feel loved by, by him, so to be intentional about our love. And so um, I, with, that, with, with that, I think that's it. Don't you guys agree? That's it. So here, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with a question. Here's the question. Are you all in? If so, if so, just say, I'm all in. One, two, three. Okay, let's go. And so my prayer during this series is that our church would have a greater vision and understanding about, man, who am I? What's my purpose, right? And I don't wanna just talk about our mission, right? I want us to make a difference, to actually impact the world and demonstrate the love of God. I wanna see the power of God unleashed on humanity through this community, and I, I want to inspire all of us to say, what, is it, what does it look like for me right now to be all in, right? To be on fire for the living God. And I, I think it's important for us in a world where people are so isolated and disconnected from the fire of God, right? Like the piece of coal that's moved away from the fire and it turns cold and gray and dark, that we're a people that say, hold up, hold up, right? We're going to push you back towards the fire of God so you'll understand the importance of of why we're here and what, what our purpose is, right? During this series, my, my heart is that, that the power and the beauty that's only found inside of the church will, will actually do its job. That will wake up to the work that's inside of each of us. And I believe that God's, God's plan to heal the earth is through the power of the local church. That's still his plan from heaven, that he, he wants us to, to be the vehicle that brings hope in the midst of despair. I say all the time that we don't just go to church, we are the church, right? And your value as a people and as a church is far greater than you can dream or imagine. The church is, is simple, it's an assembly. It's a group of God's people that are gathering. It's the Greek word is ekklesia. And so here's the thing, when we're together, people should experience, understand, and even feel the power and presence of God. They, they, should, they should be able to understand who God is because of who Matt is, right? Who, who we are in, in the spirit should be a representation of heaven. Here, here's the thing. The church is a place where the things in the natural collide with the things that are supernatural. And here at One Church, we work hard to create an intersection where the culture will constantly decrease and the message of the cross will increase. And this week, I, I saw this uh, five-star review of our church on Google. And you know what they said? It was unbelievable to me. They said four words, and I, I thought, man, I, I hope to God that's true. All, all he said was, the church is here. The church is here. May, may that be true. May, right? Come on. What a kind thing to say. And I, I want to be a part of a place that actually lives out their faith. We're not just talk. A people that recognize that, man, we're on mission. Wherever we go, whoever we're talking to, we understand we're, we're representing the God of heaven. And we can't lose sight of that. We can easily forget the simple truths of, of who I am and why we do what we do, right? Here's the deal. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's it. He came to seek and save the lost. That was his vision. He knew his mission, and as a church, I just want to say this, we unapologetically want to be like Christ. 
And so our why, when we answer our why, it should look like his. And so let me say it like this. When we lose our why, we lose our way. When we lose our why, we lose our way. And we exist to to love people far from God, right? To love God first and and, and to love his people. We, We help people in the midst of confusion and brokenness and when they're hurting because we live in a fallen world that's very broken. It's filled with lies and deception and people are walking through earth like in despair. And so we help people in the midst of that. We give reason. We help people understand their purpose. And last week, I don't know if you saw that message, but it was called I'm Invited. And if you didn't see it, I'd encourage you to go back and, and watch that and maybe even share it. Um, next, next week, it's going to be I'm Influential. The week after that is I'm Invested. Every week, it starts with an I in because these are all ways that I think we can gauge of how much we really are all in. And so today, it could be one of the most important messages that God's put on my heart, and it's called I'm invaluable. I'm invaluable. Everybody turn to the person beside you or just say it out loud. Say this. Say, I'm a masterpiece. Go ahead, say that. I'm a masterpiece. (laughs) It feels weird to say that, but it's actually true. In Psalm 139, it says that each of us were formed, right? We were created, knit together is what it says, in our mother's womb. I love the idea of that right now because I have two of my babies that are having babies, right? So I got two grandchildren that are in the womb right now being knit together by God himself. It says in the Bible that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't say that we are cheap or mediocre or just humdrum, so-so. God, God doesn't make junk, church. He doesn't make junk, And in fact, in Ephesians 2, we're actually called his handiwork or a masterpiece. Out of all of creation, when he created us, mankind, men and women, it says that we're his magnum opus, an original piece of art. And so I think this is really cool. The Greek word for masterpiece is poema, which is where we get the word poem. Imagine that. God thinks of your life as a beautiful poem that reflects his glory and tells his story. Come on, that's good. And so it's it's an unfolding story, each of us, that represents our own divine design. It says in Colossians that Christ in me, Christ in you, is the hope of glory. The world experiences the hope of glory when they bump into us. So when Jesus was here, he was telling his disciples about how valuable they were in Matthew 10. And he, he said that the very hairs on our head have all been numbered. It's a trip to me to think that our father intricately designed us and loves every small detail of us, right? He loves our nose. He loves our ears. He loves our lips, our earwax, our armpit hairs, all of it. It's his divine design. And so I want you to consider that with me. Do you understand the value of your life? We don't often talk about our own value. We don't like to tell people about, do you understand how valuable I am? In fact, the truth is, what we do about ourselves, ah, it's mean. I call it the imposter. The imposter degrades ourselves and constantly tears ourselves apart. And we talk down about ourselves. And we say things like, man, I am such a worthless, I, I am not that great, I am, I am nothing, I'm nobody. And just this week I was talking to somebody that was so low that um, they said they wished that they would die, that, that their family and their wife would be better off if they weren't here. That they, he actually believed that I don't matter that much. And if I were dead, my insurance policy would be much better off and they would live a better life. Every year, a million people take their lives in the world. About every 40 seconds, someone commits suicide. And suicide rates are at an all time high. Self hatred is a very real thing. And people are living in, in despair and discouragement 
depression. Well, I believe it's because we have a value problem. We don't know our own worth. And so I wanna talk about that today. Why don't we actually believe that we are an invaluable masterpiece? I am. Blake is an invaluable masterpiece. Do you guys understand that? (laughs) Most of us are great at like seeing the value in other people, right? We know other people are really valuable, but we don't see it in ourselves. Let me ask you a question. If I gave you $1 million, $1 million, but I told you, you only have one year to live. So you get one year to live with a million bucks. Would you take it? What about 10 million, but you could only live with that for one month? You get 10 million bucks, but one month. Okay, what about $100 million? I'm gonna give it to you, but you only get to have it for one day. One day, 100 million bucks. There's no way we take it. Absolutely not. So, so with that logic, today is worth a hundred million dollars. So why don't we live like that's true, right? There's not enough money in the world to exchange for the value of our very existence. Value is a funny thing to me. I've been thinking a lot about it, especially with all the talk of digital currency and you know what's going to happen to the dollar in America. We as humans, we assign value. We assign it. We decide. We, 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 every day, we decide what things are worth. And we, we all watch the stocks rise and fall. And it does that because it's based on public opinion. And we think, you know what? Today, I don't think that stock's gonna be worth anything. And so it drops because there's this collective conscience that somehow decides whether or not Things are worth anything. And people are so stinking fickle, right? We also know that if you buy something that belongs to someone that's rich or famous, it has way more value. It's just because we assign it. We just give it value. But it's not any different, right? Like take an old Martin guitar, right? I love Martin. They're great guitars. It might be worth 300 bucks if you found one. But if that same guitar belonged to Willie Nelson, right, now all of a sudden we can charge whatever we want, $3,000 or $3 million, right? Don't you know that you belong to God? We are children of noble birth, that we are royalty. And let me say this, when your dad's the king, then there needs to be extra security detail for those kids. Because people who want to kidnap Children all know that if they can get the child of a king, they know that they're gonna get a lot more ransom money, right? Do you know your value? Because that's exactly what Satan is trying to do down here on earth. He knows your value. Satan's here for one reason, and that's to steal our affection from the Father. He wants us to love him, and he's, he's good at it. He's, he's really good at masquerading what he wants us to love because we, we often don't outwardly go, I love Satan. But we will love stuff. We will love material possessions. We will love money. See, Satan's after our heart and our devotion. And he's really slick. He's a master manipulator. He's the great deceiver. And he wants our focus to be distracted. Distracted, that's his, that's his game. Distracted on the things of this world and not on the purpose of our Father. Here's why. Satan does not want us to know our intrinsic worth. It's crazy to me that when people ask, hey, what do you think he's worth? Seriously, what do you think he's worth? We, We immediately associate pieces of green paper What? Think about that. We assign value to humanity by the size of people's bank account, by how many pieces of green paper they have. And we take the bait, don't we? Shouldn't our worth 
come from things that are living, like maybe the living God and our family, our, our wife and our kids? Should, should our value come, come from things that are actually alive? Listen, I promise that when you're on your deathbed, we will not say, man, I just wish so bad that I had more time to make some more money. We're not gonna say that. All that matters in this world is faith in God and family. Our personal family, but also the family of God. So this is family, man. That's why I wore a t-shirt today, because I'm rocking it, and I look great in a t-shirt. I don't know why I just said that. I, oh, because I'm a masterpiece. Thank you, Mercy. My daughter thinks I'm a masterpiece. So, so th- this is why Jesus actually said, you cannot serve God and money. That's why he said that. Jesus knew that our nature is to find our value from our money and not from him. So in, in Matthew 6, it says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Be enslaved to money. And that's, that's why I tell you not to worry, not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough. Can, can you say, I have enough? Say that. I have enough. I don't need more. Well, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look, look at the birds. They don't stress. They're not anxious. They're not pulling their, plucking their feathers. They, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. Listen to what this next verse says. And aren't aren't you far more valuable to him than a bird? Can can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Can, Can stress add any value to your life? How many of you are great at stressing out? Yeah? Well, this is actually a support group for people like you. That was funny. Come on, Sarah, that was funny. It, it's all about our devotion. It's about our desires. Our father cares about the hearts of his kids. And, he, and he's saying, hey, kids, hey, kids, pay attention to what you love. What is it that you're chasing after? What, you, what do you desire? What do you yearn for? See, Jesus knew that our nature is to always chase after the love of money more than the love of our maker. Matt, I came to preach today. First Timothy 6 says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. You know, Jesus talked about money more than anything else. I don't know if you know that. And I've seen this very verse played out over and over, uh, that people that wander from their faith in God because they start to find their value and their worth in the wrong things. And I've also seen it go the other way. I've seen people go all in with God and their faith and completely devote themselves to eternal things, not things that are shiny and won't last. Again, again, when we lose our why, we lose our way. And I don't want that for any of us. I want us all on mission as the body of Christ giving value to the world around us. And the world needs that right now, don't you think? There's a lot of brokenness and so much despair, and, but, but that's why we're here. That's our mission. Jesus came here to heal the sick. So something we say at one church is, it's okay to not be okay. It's all right if you walked in here and you're not okay. Um, so, so just know that you're in the right church if you're on the hot mess express. <laughs> That's pretty good. Come on, better way, guys. That's good, isn't it? You're in the right church if you're on the hot mess express. The church does not exist for perfect people who have no problems. We come together to share our burdens and our brokenness and our mess. Your past, your past. You're like, Blake, I'm not qualified to to do the things of God. Your past does not disqualify you. It actually prepares you and it gives you purpose. Your past prepares you and gives you purpose. We heal one another, do you know that? 
we're healers. And when we've gone through something really hard, like an addiction or like gambling, all of a sudden, you know how to heal people with addictions and gambling problems. We go through cancer or a sickness or the loss of someone or divorce. Guess what? That's now your ministry. You now take your past and it gives you purpose and it prepares you to, to be on mission for the King of Kings. And that's why I think the best way to live out the mission of Jesus is found by sitting in circles. It's, it's doing life together. It's learning how, how to be a part of a, a small group or a grow group. Let, let me tell you about one of my favorite small groups in the entire Bible. It's a group of four dudes and they, they loved their friend and he was having the struggle of a lifetime and so they decided to do something about it. It's found in Mark chapter two. You ready? A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. I, I've been to Capernaum. It's an unbelievable little city right off the Sea of Galilee. And there's a ton of accounts of Jesus doing things there. And so that's why they call it home for Jesus, because it was kind of like a base of operation where he did a lot of his ministry and mission. And so he, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such a large number that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And since they could not get him to Jesus, come on, have you ever found a time in your life when you couldn't get somebody to Jesus? Maybe one of your own kids. You're trying your hardest to get him there and you just couldn't do it? Come on, Potts. Do you guys know anything about that? And so we were trying our hardest to get him to Jesus because of the crowd. They, they, decided, they decided to do this. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was laying on into the living room. When Jesus saw their faith, everybody say Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. That's what he said. Which is more important, being forgiven in the supernatural or being healed in the natural? Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right? Right? That, that's what Pharisees sound like, by the way. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's terrifying because I have some pretty bad thoughts. And Jesus knows what you're thinking. And it says, why, why does this fellow talk like that? He's, oh wait, excuse me. News what they were thinking in their hearts and Jesus says to them, hey guys, why are you thinking these things? Which I think that would make you go, I'm, so, I'm sorry, what would you say? Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, but I tell you, hey bro, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. <laughs> this amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. These dudes didn't just pass by and do nothing that day. Something happened. Something stirred in them. Their compassion put them on mission. I've affectionately named these four dudes roof crashers. They're my kind of guys. And I love, I love thinking about the conversation that happened right when they showed up and there's this massive crowd and they're going, oh, man, what, what are we gonna do? 
The other one says, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a plan. What do you want to do? And then one of them says, well, we can't just stand here. And then somebody scratches their head and says, well, I, I don't know. I, I've got an idea. What, what if we lifted them up, put them up on the roof, and ripped it open, dropped them down in there? What do you think of that? <laughs> and I can, I can see the paralyzed going, guy going, hey, uh, hey, hey, listen, <laughs> boys, this, is, this isn't your best idea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think this is going to go. I, I could drop on my head. Like, you're going to lift me up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> He had a killer small group. <laughs> friends, friends that saw him and did whatever they could to get him to the feet of Jesus. Because they knew if we do that, he's gonna be healed. I think it's important, man, that we notice that it says when Jesus saw their faith, it was their faith that Jesus saw that brought the healing. It, it was because of the faith of these men that opened the door so Jesus could offer physical healing, but most importantly, supernatural forgiveness of his sins. You have to understand the view of a paralytic in the ancient world. It wasn't good. People thought he was cursed. They thought that God did this to him because of his sin. And so I think it's important that Jesus says, you're forgiven, your sins are gone first. And then he does the supernatural. You have to understand back then there wasn't rehab programs. He didn't have surgeries. He, he lived every day with bed sores and someone had to come and clean him and carry him every day to the side of the road so he could sit there and beg. That was his lot in life. He was stuck inside of a body that held him prisoner until one day his boys showed up and they had a twinkle in their eyes and a grin on their face. They showed up on mission. They had a plan and a purpose that day. See, I think that's the best way to be a part of a small group. When, when we not only show up to learn and grow and become disciples by studying the scriptures, but also to say, let's also serve together. It's mobilizing mission. It, it's saying, I, I want this group of people, my friends, to be who I impact the world with. And today I wanna challenge you to do both. I, I want you to, to have a group and I want you to serve with that group. Because here's the deal. If you're just coming in, inside of an auditorium every, every week and that's what you think of as church and you're sitting in rows instead of circles with people that know you and sitting knee to knee that understand you and have a, 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 an understanding of your story and your heart and what you've been through, well, well see, when, when you come and sit in a church, that's not bad, but when you go through the unimaginable that leaves you paralyzed, like a death or a health problem or financial struggles or, or divorce, then, then sitting in a giant room that's filled with people that don't know you, that's probably not gonna help you. Like it or not, church, God, I just wanna say this out loud. It feels vulnerable to say it, but we desperately need each other. We need people in our lives that know us. One church, let's be a, a group of people that show up and say, I'm a roof crasher. We, we, we don't take no for an answer when you're in the midst of your pain. We, we, we don't allow friends to, to try to go it alone when they're trying to isolate and pull away and they're, they're growing gray and dark and cold. We're not those kind of people that say, that's okay, just stay there, I'll, I'll leave you alone. No, we'll pick up your mat and we're gonna take you to the fire. See, that, that's what I, I believe we're called to do. I love hanging out with roof crashers. They're my favorite kind of people. They don't give up on, on obstacles. They, they recognize that we're here to grow together and we're also here to serve together and we're gonna impact this com community in massive ways. You guys, that's the best part of the church. 
And I want to be a part of a church that does that. We, we give so much value to the community that people are drawn here by massive crowds and the parking lot's full because Jesus is in the house, right? That's, that's, that's what I want people to say. The same thing that they said about Jesus when he healed that person, the same healing happens every week here. In the supernatural, people are raised to life right there in that water. People are being baptized by the, the tons. <laughs> a lot of people are, are being healed in our presence. So I want people to show up and go, man, we've never seen anything like this. In fact, we have some stories to tell. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask Brett to come out. Brett's our groups and missions pastor, and that's on purpose. Because we believe that groups are called to mobilize mission. That through our grow groups, that's who goes and serves together. And so there's some stories about this coming Saturday that I want you to hear about, Brent. Yeah, um, one of my favorite stories is from a lady, her name's Miss Dominique. And I know that Brian Scoggins was here with you one Sunday talking through Families for Families and foster family organization that we support. Uh, Miss Dominique has been fostering kids for over a decade. Um, about seven, eight years ago, her husband died. Her husband was a military vet over 23 years in the military, uh, passed away from cancer. And they were living in Virginia and she felt like the Lord told her to move here. Uh, so she moved to Georgia. And instead of putting those kids back into whatever situation they're in, into the system, she decided she was gonna double down. And now as a single mom and a widow, wife of a military vet, she started taking in more kids. And um, her sons still live with her, they're teenagers. And to help her mom do this, they said, hey, the new house you buy, we're gonna move into this basement, it's unfinished. So they've been living years in an unfinished basement. Um, no privacy, there's no walls, just studs. And um, our church gets to go in on Saturday and finish her whole basement. We already had a team go out and paint the ceilings with Families for Families. So now um, they're gonna have walls, they're gonna have closets built, they're gonna have everything that a teenager should have in a room, um, they're gonna get blessed by our church. So that's one of them that's super special. Roof crashers. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, another one, we've got a family in our church. The husband had a pretty bad accident. Um, he's been in the hospital and they live on acres of land and nobody's been able to take care of their yard while they've been gone. And uh, so we've got people in our church. Um, Ty Diller's one of them. He's gonna go with, other, with a whole team and just completely redo their yard, redo acres of land. This is some, some big work, some sweat equity. And uh, they're just gonna love on a family that's in our church. And there's so many stories that we could talk about taking care of, of widows, of orphans. Um, just here, we're going to uh, take care of all of the kids and families for families. The parents are dropping their kids off here. And uh, they get four hours, no kids, do what you want. You can go on a date, you can go shopping, you can hang out in the parking lot and whatever you wanna do, but we're gonna take care of your kids. And we've got so many stories like that, um, but it takes all of you to make that happen. I love this man's heart and he's, he's helping put our church on mission. And uh, he's reaching out in the community, finding real needs and making a massive impact already. You guys know you can be a missionary right here in Peachtree City. You don't have to go far away. There's lots of needs right around us. And so I encourage you, it's simple. Be a part of Go Love Day. Yeah. Get online to sign up. I think there's like 30 people that have signed up and we need like two or 300. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I, just, I just want us to mobilize mission. Right. to go and serve this community in a radical way where people go, man, I, I don't really understand you people. You, you, you're weird. You, you, you love people in a radical way. And so two things. I want you to sign up for a group and be a part of one if you're not. We have like a whole lot of new group leaders that you've recruited. Tons. Right, and they can, they can do that today right after the service in the connection room. Just go out by the cafe and swing a right. And then sign up to be a part of our Go Love Day. You can do that online. Right, is it, how do you do it? Yeah, you download the Serve app or you can go online to the events page. Yeah, you know, we have a new Serve app there. that shows us how many projects are on there? Uh, 18. 18 projects. And so you can find your project that you wanna go to and you can be a part of that project, okay? So, um, church, are you all in? All right. Let me pray for us. Father, 
thank you for what you're doing in this house. Thank you for the life change that we see all around us. Thank you for transforming lives. Thank you for transforming my life. Because of the cross, Jesus, you showed us that you're gonna collide with the natural and help us be forgiven, and that's supernatural. That our sins are washed away. We're cleansed because of the blood of the lamb. And now we walk in complete freedom and we have a taste of heaven inside of us. One day, we're gonna be with you in paradise. And for that, Jesus, we wanna live. We wanna live. We wanna help people know the importance of life to help them know God and make you known, to love God and love his people. Father, send us out of here this week to go love a world that's living in despair. We love you, Jesus. It's all for your glory. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. amen.